Hey everyone, it's Irene here. Welcome to this special topic lecture for October 2021. This is live right now, so I'm just going to wait a second or two to just make sure that all systems are running well here. So if you're tuning in right now in this exact moment, let me know that you are um, hearing me and also maybe where you're from. Um, are you new to this work? Uh, have you been doing my work for a while? Are you a student? Um, are you doing somatic work somewhere else in the world? And today the topic I'm going to be diving in it, into is healing sexual trauma, healing sexual abuse, um, nervous system dysregulation as a result of um, sexual trauma, sexual abuse. And thank you for your um, comments. I'm seeing them. Um, so we're going to dive in soon um, and just know that this is a topic that has many different avenues, many different categories, and, and especially if you're new here, a lot of the principal practice theory, nervous system theory, nervous system education, all of that is is same to healing other forms of trauma, other forms of traumatic events. So I will be referring to other videos that I've done in the past so that you can learn deeper about the nervous system, what trauma actually is, what dysregulation is, what regulation of the nervous system is. I don't want to repeat myself um, when a lot of that information has already been created here on this YouTube channel and of course through my many resources all on my site um if you're first time here of course i'm irene lyon and if you haven't visited my website it's just my name.com will pop it in the chat and in the um if you're listening to this after if you're doing the recording after in the show more section i have one of my helpers diana here with me today and she will be popping in um references and links around certain things so she'll put in um, the website in a second. I'm just going to see who's here, and then we'll get started once we get a few more people in. We've got about 71, 70 people here. Hello, hello from Morocco, from Finland, from Slovenia, Norway, Saudi Arabia, Florida. Um, hey there um, to one of my 21-day students from Italy. Hello from Baja, Mexico, Switzerland, Toronto, Great. Hello from a from an SPSM alum, South Africa, Toronto. So we have a good mix of folks from all around the globe. Thank you. Someone who is a SPS, almost an SPSM member next year. Um, and so while we get people on, I'm just going to give a little shout out to some of the things that you may not know about if you're new here. So first of all, um, you'll see I've got tons of videos here and I also have other programs and courses. So my main work, my main job, if you will, is facil facilitating online courses and programs designed to help you learn about your nervous system and also how to heal and regulate your nervous system and obviously the whole body system that goes with it and how you relate with the environment. So there's something for everyone, whether it's one of our downloads that are free, one of our drop-in classes that are $19. These happen once a month on a Saturday, and that next Saturday will be this Saturday. So we'll put the drop-in link there as well if you want to learn from me from a practical point of view. Today, I'm not going to, and I can't do in this format, um, practical exercises. Um, I'm gonna be talking theory and this theme. Um, the other two things, one is the 21-day nervous system tune-up. Some people here in the chat have already mentioned that they're students of that course. That is the best way to start doing this work. If you want to start now and you want to start getting the deeper education on board, I was just speaking to someone the other day who's going through these programs and they've done a lot of healing work in different methodologies, mind, body, uh, you name it, trauma work. And they said to me just straight up, the information in the videos that you provide within these courses is something that I've never seen or heard before. And that isn't because this information is secret. It's just that 
this field that I am in, namely somatic experiencing. This is the work of Peter Levine. I've got notes that I'm going to quote a little bit today from Peter um, because he was one of the main people that taught me about the ins and outs of healing from sexual traumas and the importance of the somatic system in relationship to healing sexual trauma, sexual abuse. Um, but the education is so important, you guys. I don't know how to say that other than just to say it's very important because we have this higher brain of ours that needs to understand what's going on in the physiology. And this is going to come in to play as I get into today's lecture. And then, of course, within these programs, there are the practices that are not typical of mind body work. They're very subtle. They're very simple, but they're very potent. And I'm sure some of my students who are here in the chat might be able to attest to that and share some of their experiences if they're open to doing so. Um, it brings into light not just the mind and the body, but how these two things connect to the environment and also how it connects to our cognition and this higher brain to be able to make sense of what's happening in our physiology and how we, re we are reacting to the world. So I'm going to get into the comments again just to see who's here and um, we'll get started. I see some familiar names. Hey there, Darla. Good to see you here. One of my students, another Michigan, Michigan, another alumni. Hello from the UK. Now, the other thing I'll start off right off the bat. Let's just say you would like to work with someone one on one, and that's fine because a lot of times people will say, Irene, I'm in this part of the world. Do you know someone? Now, I don't know everybody in the world who does this work. That would be impossible. Hope you understand that. Um, but I would suggest watching a video I did, oh gosh, maybe a year or so ago, titled How to Find a Good Somatic Practitioner. How to Find a Good Somatic Practitioner. We'll pop it in the chat and in the show more section. Now, the reason why this is really important is because there's no real accreditation or standards for this work yet. It's up to us, the person, the practitioner, to do our due diligence and to learn and to study um, I was fortunate enough just to give you an idea of doing multiple, multiple master classes with the man himself, Peter Levine, at a high level. I assisted at that level, at these trainings, at these classes. I have studied with many other mentors at this level, Kathy Kane, namely um, of Somatic Practice, to name another. I'm not going to get into all of that, but check out that video. But I will say that it is important um, to understand your physiology from a cognitive point of view and what this stuff is all about. It just makes the one-on-one -on -one process a lot easier. So um, we will get started soon with the specifics. And thank you for someone just commenting. Someone just said, I've been becoming, I've been becoming more grounded and present, present after starting the 21-day program and doing other related work realized recently that I no longer trip over things. Yes. Or, or walk into corners. Yes. Now this is so important regarding the topic today of sexual trauma and healing it. And I'll maybe just start off the bat. So, um, thank you for that. Cause that primed me. If we think about any kind of insult to our physical system, it could be physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, familial, environmental, right? There's so many things in this world that make it such that us humans feel under threat. So I'm just going to start really basic because I don't like to say one trauma or one abuse is bigger or worse than another because it really depends, you guys, on the person and the circumstance, I did another video on this a little while ago titled something like um, why some folks are more resilient than others. And it has a lot to do with what occurred to us in our first few years of life, how we were regulated at that core level via our primary caregiver, usually our mother, how she was regulated, how she was connected to her body. Could she attune to herself and could she attune to you, the infant, 
and you when you were in utero. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be a mother. It could be a caregiver, a, a nanny, a babysitter, but usually it's that primary first connection. And so how we were raised greatly determines how well we bounce back from adversity later in life and stressors. So I say that at the beginning because I know there's a variety of people here. Right now we have 122 people here. We come from all walks of life. We've all had all different upbringings, different culture, different religion, different values and principles. We're at different age categories. Some of us are maybe in our 80s. Some of us are in our 20s. I'm in my mid 40s. And so there's so much variety in the human system. This is why you guys at understanding the principles are really important. So if I go back to that thing that I was saying about trauma, and having something big and bad and scary happen to us, like a sexual attack, like a sexual abuse, our system, just like if it was a car accident or being struck by um, a car or being screamed at at the kitchen table, eating our dinner, ridicule, all these things, our physiology is going to go into a threat response. So this is like number one. And when it goes into a threat response, it goes into this concept of fight and flight. So most people have heard of this. It is the mobilization of our entire physiology, our heart, our breathing, our guts, our attention, our hormones. It's making it such that it is like pushing forward. I have to protect, I have to attack, I have to fight, I have to flee. Now it's possible in an accident situation or in an abusive situation that the person under that attack, under that threat is not able to fight or flee. This is kind of the, the crux of the nervous system, autonomic nervous system work. I want to fight, I want to flee, but I can't. And so if the system realizes, that person realizes at the core physiological level, I am not getting out of here. The next line of survival, the next line of defense is to freeze, is to go numb at the body level. We might dissociate at that mind thinking, cognitive brain level. We might um, notice and realize I can't get out of here. I, I got to kind of numb out. I have to put myself into a different state of being. And people will say that they'll even float above their bodies and see the abuse occurring to them, right? And so that's a protective strategy. And so the first thing I'm going to say for those of you here who've experienced such things, and this is also true for, let's say, someone who's having a surgical intervention, and it's really scary, and it's really painful, or an accident. So I like to, because some of you listening might not have a history of sexual abuse or trauma, and you're just here for interest sake, which is great. But there's stuff here for others, even if it wasn't that specific kind of trauma. So I just want to put that in there as well. But let's just say we're, we're freezing down, we're shutting, we're like, I can't fight, I can't flee, I'm going to freeze. The system can go through a few things from there. One it may stay rigid and very frozen, or what often happens is everything collapses. The system goes into what we would call a true dorsal shutdown of the vagus nerve. Now I did videos on the vagus nerve, something called the polyvagal theory, many of them. One is a video um, and one is a long form lecture. So check those out afterwards. We'll post them again in the chat here. But it's protective. So for those of you here who feel like their bodies didn't do the right thing because you didn't fight and you didn't flee, but you froze, I'm here to say your body did exactly what it was supposed to do. It was protecting you. Now, the trouble, the trouble that comes with this is that and this is very societal, very cultural. It's where we are in humanity right now. 
So it's kind of like just the general thing is when we come out of these things that are really big, bad, and scary, these events that put trauma into our system, there isn't a solid protocol at the somatic and nervous system level to work with this. And I'm generalizing because, of course, if something like this were to occur to me or my husband or my colleagues or some of my students, you guys would know exactly what to do. You would know, oh, wow, I just froze and shut down. I better do some work to get myself out of this freeze. I've done videos on how to come out of freeze. Again, make sure to check those out. You guys have lots of homework for yourselves if you're here and you're new. So because we don't have that in place when a person, say, goes to the hospital or they go to the, um, the police or whatever, even going to the hospital and going to the police is a traumatic situation in itself. And so they're just not set up for that. Now, in some cases, there might be. But that's where you have to learn about this stuff so that you know what to do. So I just wanted to start off with a very broad overview of fight, flight, freeze, and then how our system might go into these actions, into these survival responses to protect us. Now, let's just say, fast forward to now, and you're, you know cognitively that you had an abuse of this kind, a sexual abuse and you are pretty certain that you're still numb or the flip side, living in a high state of anxiety and stress. If it's the latter, so I'm going to, I'm going to draw pieces here in the imaginary flipboard that I have. Let's just say that, you know, that you are living in a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic, and you know that it's because of these early traumas, your system is stuck in what we would call fight and flight. It's looking for danger. It's hyper vigilant to the environment. It doesn't trust the environment. It's everything in the environment is dangerous and you are guarding yourself and protecting with that physiology. A lot of people end up being very type A, very driven, very aggressive with their work, with their relationships, because it helps them work with that high level of survival stress that's fight, flight, fight, flight. So they match it. The flip side, let's just say, and I'm doing all these stories, you guys, hypothetically, so they're vignettes. And so you'll have to see where you might fit into this category. But let's just say you know that you froze and you disconnected and you dissociated and you went numb in your body, that means that you actually might not be aware of the environment. You might be disconnected not only from your body, but from that which is around you. You may not feel when you have a belly ache or when you're tired. And so when we're shut down, we can also push and, and override because we're not feeling anything. We also might end up with a chronic illness. So there's a very large connection with those who um, have fibromyalgia, autoimmune, chronic illness, and this level of trauma because the system is deeply, deeply set in a state of dysregulation. The fight and the flight and then the shutdown freeze is basically having a party in the body and it's taxing all of the physiological sy systems which are coming out as symptoms and signs and, and illness. So again, just because someone had a type of, let's say, sexual abuse doesn't mean they're automatically going to have high levels of anxiety or high levels of shutdown. One might be one, one might be other, or it might change depending on the circumstance you're in, depending on the environment you're in. So I wanted to also set that as a primary um, foundation. Now, one thing that Peter Levine said in um, one of these trainings that I was at ages ago, I don't even know the date, it was like 2015, 16, I believe. Um, he said, and I wrote it down just so I get it right. If we can't master our life force energy, we can't master our life. So I'm going to say that one more time. If we can't master our life force energy, we can't master our life. 
And when you speak to folks who have survived all sorts of traumas and of course, sexual trauma as well. And again, I'm generalizing because some folks have healed and recovered and they have strong life force energy and they're doing their stuff and they're not living in the past. They've done the work. But for those that haven't yet done the nervous system work, there will often be, as I said, this, this quality of shutdown in the body. The systems just aren't working in good balance and good flow and good resiliency and regulation. And life is really damn fucking hard. It is hard to get anything done. And we can say that it's a sense, um, a case of being physiologically depressed. When I say that, I want to also connect another dot here. And that is the importance. If we know that we have the shutdown in our body and we couldn't fight and we couldn't flee inside of our physiology is intense. I'm going to assume, but usually this is the case, intense, intense anger, intense, healthy aggression, a desire to strike, a desire to hit, a desire to kick and punch and strangle and run away. Those are big survival energies. But if they're trapped inside because of the lack of information and, um, just facilitation of healing at this nervous system somatic level, that trapping of all of that life force energy, that animal bear, mama bear protection energy, trapping that inside is exhausting. And I'm sure some of you here are nodding your head going, yep, that's me. So let me know if that's the case or let others know. And so part of this journey of healing from these sexual abuses and traumas and this trap survival energy isn't about just going out and hitting things with a baseball bat or being violent, which is what we see in our world when the nervous system isn't in good regulation. We don't know how to get that healthy aggression out in a healthy way. What we want to do is build foundation and capacity and understand what these impulses are that are trapped inside so that when they start to bubble up, we cognitively know what's happening and we can work with them. I hope this is making sense. I'm going to go to the comments in a second and then go into a bit of another piece here on why working with the body is important and how we do that from a theoretical point of view. And then I'll also get into some other pieces. Um, Let's see here. I caught someone saying here that just by hearing this, they're feeling a little anxiety. Let's see, where did that comment go? There's so many comments that I might not find it now. So what I will speak to is this. If you're here and you're listening to this out of interest and you start to feel yourself having a response, a reaction, a tightening, a shutdown, which might look like getting sleepy and or fidgety or not wanting to listen to this. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have hidden memories of sexual trauma in your system. Doesn't necessarily mean that. And I'm going to share a story actually right now um, in a second. I'm just trying to find that comment. I also see some, ah, uh, there it is. Someone said, Kaya said, listening to this brings up some survival stress. I'm just trying to be with it and stay connected. Wonderful. Yes, that is part of this work, being with it, staying connected to it. And if it's a little too much, walk away. This is being recorded. Say bye, Irene, shut your computer, turn off your phone, go for a walk, do something that you know can help you feel this energy without shutting it down. Because we don't want your systems just by learning this education to uh, blow up into a big panic attack or go into a deep survival stress, um, which can happen, right? It can happen just by hearing this stuff. Um, and someone mentioned uh, just above that, any insight on someone who has something um, to happen to them when they're very young, but has no memory of it. I will get into that. 
So there's a great story that Peter shared in one of our classes. And let me just have a little sip of water here. Where he was working with someone, and I don't remember all the details because I think it was just a story he was giving us about something he had worked with in the previous years of his life. Um, and it was a gentleman who assumed he had been molested, abused, traumatized at the sexual level. And I don't remember the details, but there was a very strong pulling of his pelvis, like his, his pelvis would retract. Um, and I can't remember, my assumption is that there was trouble with his sexual capacity, maybe shame, maybe numbness in that area. And so if we think about typically where sexual abuses occur, it's around the perineum, around the pelvis, obviously in females, the vagina, but the anus as well, the, the penis for men, um, our mouths, all these areas, but the pelvis is a big area where a lot of these energies are held and where these survival stresses are held and tension is held. And so he just assumed I must have been harmed in some way. And they worked with it. And, and then this memory came up when he was, I think, a young teenager, he had to have a, um, circum a medical circumcision. Again, I don't know the details, but for whatever reason, he had to have his foreskin removed. I hope it was done under anesthetic. I'm pretty sure it was if it was done in Western society. But then the recovery is where things got crazy in that his mother had to um, change the bandages on his penis and she was very uncomfortable doing that. Probably feeling embarrassed with her teenage son, almost teenage son, having to change bandages on his penis after the surgery. I'm sure he was in a lot of pain. I'm sure he was uncomfortable. And so what she did to avoid having to take time and care was she would just rip off the bandages really, really quickly. And I can't imagine how how much that would hurt having had bandages on cuts and incisions in my own day, let alone on the most sensitive area in the male human body. So she would rip off the bandages. I'm sure this happened multiple times. And so his nervous system somatic response, can you guys guess what it might have been? Would be to pull away, to pull back his pelvis and just try to get that part of his body away. But she was pulling forward. And so with that, there becomes what we would call this coupling dynamic of the movement, the strong movement of his pelvis along with pain. And then mother, who is, you know, this primary caregiver, she's embarrassed. He's probably feeling embarrassed. And then you've got the pain of it. So all of these emotions and sensations and movements and survival responses are playing into this, let alone the fact that there is probably not a lot of open communication around this, because I'm, I'm sure that this, this story is from many, many, many years ago, if not decades ago. So this is an example of how we can have a physical traumatic experience, because that is definitely traumatic, but it's not a sexual attack per se. It's not a molestation. It's just something that has occurred in that part of the body. While I'm on this topic, I'm going to mention a few other things that sometimes are implanted in the body where someone might believe that they've had a sexual abuse, but it isn't. Um, females, males, but usually females, I've seen this, if they were involved in sport, like high intensity sport, especially things like gymnastics, where they're falling on their pelvis, especially on the pubic bone. Think about being on one of those balance beams. I know I used to do this in gym class when I was a kid. I never fell on that thing, but I know that if you slip and fall and bang yourself right on that pubic bone, it is going to hurt. You might even fracture that area. Same with falling on the tailbone. I've done that before. It hurts. And then what occurs is all those little muscles. There's so many muscles, the perennial muscles, the rectal muscles, um, the, the, um, they're called the rotators of the glutes, 
tiny little muscles that keep the pelvis stable and allow our hips to move and also allow us to stop the flow of urine or to allow the urine out or bowel movements, all these things, there's a lot of musculature in that area. If you've not looked at the anatomy of that area, it's worth a look because you don't realize how much nuance and how much sensation is in that area. And so if someone, female, male, doesn't really matter, hits that area, it will send a shock into that area. And can you remember what I said at the very beginning about going into fight, flight, but also freeze? While recovering that and maybe immobilizing that area, there is going to be the frozenness, very technical term, the numbness. We might dissociate from it, just like if you were to break an arm, you might dissociate a bit from the bone as it's healing. And so that's another example of how we might, as adults or later in life, let's say we're being intimate or we're um, in that area of our body or we're having a medical exam and all of a sudden we have this fear and pain and panic when someone or we or a partner goes into that area, don't assume that it's because of a repressed memory from childhood or infancy or whatever. It could be something like this because this area can get hit and damaged in many other ways. Of course, we could spend a whole hour talking about all the different ways. Surg surgeries, of course, there is um, circumcision of the male and the female, which in my opinion should not happen um, because that is taking a part of the body away. It is a threat to the system. Um, for me, it's just supposed to be there, so please don't take it off. And of course, that happens to many, many folks, um, men and women. And it's just important to understand that that can also cause a traumatic response that has nothing to do with being abused at that level. So um, I have a few people in here saying, yep, racing bikes. Yes, I've fallen on the seat of my bike and the bar on the bike, and it's very, very, very painful, very painful. Um, so thank you so much for all your comments, you guys. So I'm actually going to talk about the next thing by answering someone's question around not having any memories. So I'll, I'll feed this in. A lot of the previous ways of working with trauma in general has been talk therapy. Now, there's nothing wrong with talk therapy because we have this higher brain, we want to be able to use it, create meaning, make sense of what's occurred to us. We might need to get something out and we need to talk to a professional. So I am all for that, completely for that. I've used therapists many times in the past myself. They're all somatically inclined, I might add, but it's still important. The difficulty in only working from the neck up in our thoughts with something like a sexual abuse is that we're not getting into the body and it just comes back to the body. And I've already alluded to these things. So if we think about, again, that survival mechanism to pull away in our pelvis, to run, to hit, to um, contract those muscles. So a very common area that is under intense stress and duress with this form of abuse and trauma is that the, the genitals, the perineum, as I've already mentioned, and those deep rotators of the butt, um, the pelvis, the glutes, they're called the piriformis, the obturators. And of course, they're deep, deep, deep in the pelvis wall. Also, some of you have heard of the hip flexors, namely the anatomical term is the iliopsoas. It connects to the front of the spine and it goes to the thigh bone, bone to help us flex. So if you do a sit up, you're using the iliopsoas, the hip flexors. But, and you guys can all play with this, if you think about the position of um, protecting this area, it would be that classic example of pulling the tail under, right? You can all try that with me. Pulling the tail under, 
um, kind of that idea of, you know, the dog that's done something wrong and they pull their tails under. It's kind of a, a, a pattern of shame in a way, toxic shame. If we've been locked in that flexed, pulled in, usually with it, there comes a tightness. Uh, even as I do that, it's hard for me to talk. There comes a tightness in the belly. There's a tightness in the breath. There's a tightness then in the diaphragm and in all the other parts above. If there's a tightness in this big, big pelvis structure and that tightness has been incessant and insidious since we were little, one, we might not even know that we have a pelvis or we might know that anything that happens around this pelvis is terrifying or we don't like to be touched there. And so part of the work and healing at this somatic and nervous system level is to get better acquainted and better familiar with the pelvis structure, the muscles, how they work, how they might stay tight all the time, how to find relaxation in them. And how a person goes about that is very, very dependent on where you are at in your journey. Um, for example, Sometimes we will go to say a somatic therapist or a body movement, let's say something like yoga, and you're working with the pelvis, you're doing stuff with the pelvis. And if the system, if you as the person is not aware of the amount of fight and flight and shutdown going on, <clears throat> too much might occur too soon. And this is where, for those of you new here, you'll have to just trust me with this information. But what has to happen is you have to titrate your way to working with that area. So let's just say you're doing a movement with the pelvis, or you're getting some massage done. Often that's even too much to begin with. You actually might want to start with parts of the body that are more distal, more further away from the pelvis. It might mean working with the shoulders. It might mean working with the hands, with the feet, with the knees, with the elbows, even with the joints of the fingers. Now by this, I mean very specific work where you might see a somatic practitioner and they do touch, um, maybe it's massage, maybe it's some form of physical therapy, but there's this thought or this idea or this expectation, I have sexual trauma, my, um, glutes and my perennial muscles and all of the internal muscles and the vaginal canal and, and all those areas, they're so tense. We need to get in there and work on it. And I do know that there are physical therapists that work internally within these muscular areas to help massage and sometimes even break up scar tissue. Now I've done enough of this work to know that that doesn't always end well because often the person going in doesn't have the capacity to be with that intensity. And then what do you think occurs? They often will shut down because it's too much or they don't even realize they're not aware and awake to it. The system is just numb and all that's being worked on is the structure. And so this is where, again, as simple as it might sound, how can you connect to feeling your feet on the floor? How can you connect to feeling your thighs on the back of the chair or on the chair? How can you connect to feeling your hands on your thighs? How can you connect to feeling your hands on your ribs, on the chest bone, on the back of the spine, near the lumbar, lower back? Um, can you touch different areas of your body that are distal away from the pelvis as a warm up to get closer and closer towards that area. But it's not about diving right in and getting into that area and waking it up with aggressive um, physical therapy, massage, or even aggressive movement like certain yoga poses. So I say all this, and I'm kind of hitting you with all these ideas just to say you have to get to know your body and you have to get to know what your threshold is for sensing. Being able to have what we would call the sensate quality is so important. 
And so if it's even difficult to feel when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, if it's difficult to feel the need to go to the bathroom, to urinate, to have a bowel movement, if it's hard to pass gas, if it's hard to burp up gas, as crazy as it sounds, and my students here who have been with me for a while, they know how powerful it is by working with these basic somatic biological pieces. Maybe some of you can give a, a thumbs up, a high five um, to just say yes, as, as simple as these things are, connecting with these basic biological pieces is an entryway into working with the greater physiology and then titrating is the word. So I did a special topic lecture in September on titrating this ability to titrate, in other words, drop by drop, so that we don't overwhelm the body the way it got overwhelmed in the attack or the abuse or the chronic abuse. Am I making sense? There needs to be this slow, digested, acceptance, consensual, all of it, so that we can color in the parts of our body that have gone kind of black and gray. Thanks everybody for your comments. I'm going to head into the comments for a second and then I'm going to go into another piece. Now, what is again, like I said, most important, go into the comments in a second. I mentioned at the start of that, that last piece, why just talk therapy isn't enough. The reason why, again, just to reiterate the trauma, the abuse is happening at the body level. Now, of course, our mind has to make sense of it and our thinking has to make sense of it. But trust me when I say when you get better, when you become more apprenticed at being with these physiological sensations and biological impulses in your system, it is a much more grounded capacity building way to work with these stored traumatic stressors. Okay. And then I'm going to add one more piece. The question that someone had earlier about not having any memory. So there's again, two branches to this. This is why this stuff is complex. If we are under the age of, I, people will say three to me, it's kind of five, four ish, but three is kind of that cutoff that would determine anything from three years old under and in utero would be considered developmental and early trauma. And at that level, we're not cognitively creating what's called declarative memories of the world. All of our memories are implicit in the body. They're procedural. They're within our physical senses. They're not even emotional at that level. So when someone says, I was sitting there and I, or I was on the massage table and I was having this part of my body touched and I thought it felt good. And then all of a sudden I was spiked with a heart rate that went to like 60 to 200 like that, or 150. And there was no memory. I just, all of this, I wasn't even scared. It was just boof. That is a way that the body can knock on our door and say, this is an old memory. This is an old fight flight fight, flight, survival stress, shifting and popping through because you're now at ease a little bit more. You're connecting to the body. And let's say you are enjoying the massage and it feels good and you trust the person. You're no longer in that shutdown, right? And so as we lift the brakes off of the shutdown, we're going to feel these old, old body somatic memories. And that, again, my friends, is why it's so important to understand the theory, because if we don't understand the theory, we're not going to know what's happening. OK, I'm going to go into the comments. Ah, Liz says, thanks for priming me, you guys. Would even more everyday sexual relationships become traumatic because of how unaware we are of our boundaries as a society? Yes. So I'm just going to give a vignette. 
an example that's sort of hypothetical, but I've seen it. Let's just say you're in a relationship. And let's just say you really want to be in the relationship and you like the person and it's it's safe and you're there. You know that you've maybe had some past sexual trauma, maybe even the partner, your husband, wife, whomever, they know that you've had that as well. And you want to work on healing this and you know that it is almost impossible to be intimate with your partner because all of the floods of memories come back or there's a sense of disgust or it just being gross and not good. And so then the other partner gets frustrated because of course they want to be intimate with you and they just want to be intimate and they want to have sex and they obviously aren't going to force you because they're a, a, a good safe person, but there's tension. And so this is where for a partnership specifically, there needs to be, again, in my opinion, in my experience, A, open communication and B, them, the partner and you, the person who's maybe healing, you must understand the physiology. I'll give you an example. I gave this example to my students in spring. So if you're wanting to be intimate with your partner and you're laying in bed and you're feeling, um, you know, some love and connection, and then all of a sudden you, and I'll speak, I'll just pretend I'm the person, you as the, 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 the partner who was abused, all of a sudden has this deep desire to push your husband away. And it's not because you don't like him. But it's, a, it's like that thing I said a second ago about the heart rate going up on the massage table. You're ma and you're not even doing anything sexual. It's just cuddling, it's touching. And then all of a sudden something comes up in your body and you wanna push or you wanna scream or you wanna say, I hate you or get off of me or I want you to die or there's a desire to want to kick them or jump out of the bed. I mean, there's so many situations there. If your, let's say, husband isn't aware of how the fight, flight, and freeze works and isn't aware, you haven't had the conversation that, hey, honey, uh, when we're sleeping one night I, or when we're cuddling, there might be a moment where I want to tell you to, to get out or I might want to hit you or I might want to pretend that I'm about to strangle your neck. All these things. This is where that healthy aggression comes in. If he isn't aware of this level of need for your somatic body to get that out, you have a problem because in that situation, you, me, for example, this isn't my story. I'm just, again, using this as an example. You will then feel held back. You will not express that genuine life force energy. Remember when I quoted Peter, the quote was, if we can't master our life force energy, we can't master our life. If we want to put that out and then we feel like we can't because we know they don't want to do any of this weird, crazy somatic work, we're in a bind. And yes, one can go to their somatic practitioner or their therapist, or they can go to a yoga retreat, or they can go into the bathroom and get that energy out. After the fact, of course we can do that. But if you want to be able to create that intimacy that's free and open and feels good, you've got to have help getting that out often with that partner. Now, this isn't going to be possible for everyone because maybe you don't have a partner and that's fine. And then that is where you might work with a somatic practitioner or you're working at self-touch you're working at feeling your body, you're working at exploring and feeling and touching and maybe all the things that come with that. And then you feel that desire, that bubbling, and maybe you do remember your perpetrator's face and name. And that is where you imagine, imagine everyone folks, this is not real life. It's you imagine in your mind's eye that you feel in your physiology what would it be like to move that life force energy out, protect yourself, act 
exclaim, kick, punch, scratch, run on the spot, whatever it might be. And what comes out, I can't tell you what that is. It's so individual. And in working with my students who have survived these abuses, they will say, I was sitting down, Irene, doing a very gentle, um, we would call them diaphragm lesson in my Smart Body, Smart Mind course. It's kind of what you would do if you were to go to a practitioner and have very gentle touch work. So they might just touch the shoulders, they might touch the, the bottom rib, maybe the pelvis, maybe the elbows, maybe even just the wrists or maybe the ankles. But this one um, student, I remember she was saying I was holding my upper diaphragm here and just tracking in the way that I teach people how to track. And all of a sudden there was this rage come out of the arm. And I can't remember what it was, but it was something along the lines of hitting or smacking or moving the hand in what's called the self-protective procedural memory to get it out. And if I can recall after that occurred, the shoulder issue that she was having and the wrist issue, it shifted, it healed. Um, actually, Diana, you're here. I think that was the interview I actually did with Janet Raftis on healing sexual trauma. So you can pop, pop that one down. She shared that story and it's a great story. But here's what I also will say with that to go back to the question about um, someone not having memory, but also how we can work with ourselves. Um, we don't need to always know the story. We might not have to try to figure out the pieces. We just have to work with the body and watch for what comes up with the understanding of the nervous system education that this desire to push away, even though there's no one there, is the thing that you couldn't do when you were 10, when you were five, or maybe when you were three years old and someone was molesting you and you couldn't because you were too weak. But as I said at the top of the hour, it could also be, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit to non-sexual trauma. Maybe you were an infant in an incubator when you were young and they had to keep putting IVs in your arms and you were held down and you just wanted to do that. You wanted to push away and not have them touch you. It could be something like that. Okay. Hmm. One thing that just sparked, I saw someone, um, are we sexually, why are we sexually attracted to our pain? This isn't going to answer your question directly so much, but one of the things that um, can sometimes occur when someone is, is, feeling these bodily sensations is there'll be deep, deep confusion around pleasure. Because let's just say there was molestation, sexual abuse, and you were old enough to register that it actually felt good. And I worked with folks who are in this boat and it felt good. There was arousal, but they also knew that what was happening wasn't right. It was wrong. And so there becomes this tug of war wherein, well, if I'm feeling pleasure, as I think about this, this just doesn't, it, it gets confusing. And then it makes us think, well, what was done to us was then maybe okay, because it gave us pleasure, but it isn't okay. So again, these are where we have to get very clear with the lines of that was not okay and, and separate that from, and yes, my body, my physiology was aroused and that's okay. But what happened wasn't okay. You see where I'm going here? You've got, we've got to be able to tease apart the fancy word in the SE language is decouple the, the, the quality, the feeling of it along with the meaning and knowing that that's not okay and, and not saying to ourselves, well, that was that okay? No, wasn't okay, but yes, your physiolo physiology said differently. Okay. Just going through your comments, you guys. 
Ah, I'm going to read this because there's some key words in here of emotion. In the last month, more and more anger, disgust, fear, and sadness is going out of me. Sometimes it's damn scary. Yes, it can be because these are disgust, anger, and fear are deep, deep, deep emotions that are sparked via these survival impulses. And so it will feel scary. And then you write, um, I feel lighter and optimistic, but the days are pretty tough. Every day something new wants to come out. So yes, this is exactly how this work works. It takes time, but it takes understanding that we, if we trapped those deep sensations, which are our emotions in our body, they're going to come out and they're going to come out intensely. And this is again, why we want to start with, remember what I said a while ago, can you feel your viscera? Can you feel your feet on the ground? Can you learn how to orient? Learning how to orient is a huge part of this. It's what we work with and teach our students at the beginning of all of the trainings and also in my drop-in classes. I've done two videos on orienting. One is a longer form lecture um, called What the Heck is Orienting? And the other is um, about healing trauma and the two types of orienting. So just a quick note on orienting, because that is part of our somatic system. Orienting is our capacity to see the world around us and orient to it. And the two types of orienting, one would be exploratory orienting. So as I look at your comments, I'm exploring those comments. If I were to look at my desk, I would explore the paper, the pens, the clock, uh, the box of tissue, those sorts of things. It's an exploration. There's no fear attached to it. But when we have an abuse, a bad, scary thing occur to us, our eyes, which are our brain, they alert, they become defensive. It's like the deer out in the woods that hears the crackle of something and they, they orient defensively, right? I'm sure all of you have seen this and you've done this yourself. Large bang comes from outside of the house, you might startle and orient to it. So when we have had these things occur to us, our orienting response might be a little wonky it might be on high alert all the time. And for those who've been here from the beginning, the very top of the hour, I talked about fight flight, remember? That's that hypervigilance. Everything is dangerous. No one is safe. I can't trust anyone. I can't trust anything. No one can touch me. So if we've had harms and abuses, we might go into that hypervigilance. And then that poses a problem obviously with relationship, ease, being in the world. But the other side of this is not having any defensive orienting and kind of being in a tunnel vision and not seeing the dangers come to us, not noticing that there's a, a dangerous predator over there in the corner that we might need to walk away from, right? This idea of walking down the dark alley, dark alleys aren't bad. It's whether or not we have the perception of danger online. But if we've had lots of very bad, scary things happen to us, like I said, we might never go down that dark alley or walk down that street or go into that bar or go into that social event or meet someone because it's too terrifying. Or we might overly commit ourselves to the environment and not have a filter. So orienting is one of the key somatic practices to healing all of our traumas, not just sexual. And that's why at the beginning I said a lot of these um, concepts, they relate to everything. But I do know that people will say, and this is a very common thing, and Peter Levine has actually um, I forget what book it is in, but he has worked with perpetrators, those who commit the crimes, who commit the abuses, the sexual attacks, etc. And they will say the folks who commit the crimes, they can tell, they can tell in a crowded room who they can attack, who will be more likely to be good, good. I know it's a terrible word but who they will mo most likely be able to abuse. And it's not because 
of an intellectual thing or how a person is dressed or or those things it's their body sense it's the level of fear that is in their system and that either vigilance or the lack of usually it's lack of vigilance they don't know what's coming at them and if we are in that shutdown our spidey senses are off and so Part of healing this also means that we are going to be able to go out in the world and get be in a situation we, where we are less harmed, we are more able to perceive danger, and we're more able to perceive safety. That's the flip side, right? We're able to perceive danger, but we're also going to know, oh, this group of people is, I can tell, they're good people to be with. A classic kind of byproduct of not healing these traumas is we get into the same relationships over and over and over again. Okay, I'm going to go back into the comments here. Hmm, yeah, one person wrote, it's helpful to understand our body cannot know what type of trauma, it just knows it's trauma. Yes, yes. Yes, Samantha just wrote a catheter. So a catheter is a very small um piece of plastic that will go up into the urethra of both men and women to help them urinate if they're unwell or or there's a blockage or something yes that is a great example of something also that would be that could be lodged in the mind as um i mean we could say it is a sexual trauma it's a sexual abuse to those i mean we could say that the urethra is not a sex organ however it is still very close to those areas so for me it, it molds into that area. But part, again, of healing this is being able to differentiate what it is. Like, oh, that was, that was a catheter. I needed that. I needed that for whatever reason. Okay. 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 Thanks for all your concepts, Co comments, guys. Yeah. Someone just said, um, chiropractic care has helped me release a lot of tension and misalignment, Oops. misalignment in my body to help me move on with the rest of the work. That's a great comment. Thank you for that. Uh, simple savvy. Um, yeah, uh, craniosacral massage, Cairo, really good osteopathic work, um, even some really good Chinese medicine and acupuncture and pressure points, reflexology. All of that stuff is wonderful. And I advocate for folks seeking out practitioners in that somatic body based way. And then the key, and yeah, someone said the atlas as well, which is the very top of the spine. The key is being able to feel what's going on. And this leads me to actually um, something that is important to understand. If we don't have a little bit of foundation on board and this capacity to track what's happening in our physiology, it can be very, very easy to get, uh, miss the healing from these sessions. Right. So if I think about when I was young, I had had acupuncture and I to me, it did nothing like in my 20s. It didn't make sense to me. Um, and now in my mid 40s with that, this awareness, when I have acupuncture or even acupressure, I can feel through my whole system, the shifts and the changes and the energy directions. And I know how to breathe with it or not breathe with it. I know how to engage with the practitioner I'm working with, as opposed to just lying there and kind of being a lump that doesn't engage with that interaction. So yes, body work is wonderful. And then it's very, very, very important to um, be able to feel and sense. Okay. Someone wrote, how do you stop being prey? In other words, prey uh, written to P-R-E-Y. I feel like you just described something that ended, ended with my going through a wall with my last partner. Um, the same thing over and over. So the way we stop being prey, um, Maureen, is we do the work to 
release these old trapped survival energies. So if you didn't get the top of this, go back and listen to the recording, but the fight, flight, and freeze. So when we have in our system all this stored stress, we're not accurately able to connect with ourselves, but also the environment around us and something called our perception of danger or safety. It's called neuroception. Our neuroception is a little wonky. So as we grow our capacity to be with what's inside and as we grow our capacity to move forward and not hold more stress inside, and as we start to allow the bubbling up of old survival stressors to come up and out, we start to become less dysregulated in our nervous system and in our capacity to engage with the world. And that is how we become less uh, susceptible to these potential attacks and threats and toxic relationships. I hope that answers your question. Just looking through the chat again, you guys. Hmm. Daniela says, why is it that once one, once one feels safe, committed and trust with a partner, they retract sexually and everything feels impossible and freezes. So I don't know your situation, but I'll speak to one thing that I find quite common, Daniela. Let's just say that we knew that we grew up in an environment that wasn't safe. It doesn't have to be due to sexual abuse, but it could be. Let's just say our family system. Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, but it was just not safe. And then we do a lot of work, good work, to find ourselves in, like you said, a safe, committed, trusting, respectful relationship with another human being. That gives our system at that autonomic nervous system level the cue, you finally can let your guard down. You can finally relax. You don't need to have the armor on your body. You don't have to please, even though you don't want, you know, not wanting to. You don't have to do things that don't feel good. You can actually set boundaries and say, I don't want this. And so what often occurs is when we have that safety, all of the old patterns and all of those old monkeys on our back will come up and be like, okay, now that it's safe, we're going to work on all this stuff that we couldn't work on because everything else before and all the environments we were in previous were unsafe and we couldn't, we couldn't feel these things. We couldn't feel the freeze. We couldn't feel the survival energy. And so with that, there might be a period of time where it's like, don't touch me, I'm not doing that. And that doesn't mean that that won't come back, but there needs to be a period where that boundary is being exerted because it maybe never was able to be exerted, expressed in the past. And this is where, Daniela, if you were here earlier, where I spoke about the importance of two partners really being on the same page and really understanding what this work is all about. Um, for those of you, again, that are new, if you haven't watched my three-part healing trauma video training. It's 100% free on my site. We'll post it here. The first video especially describes this analogy. I have an analogy of um, swimming pools and beach balls where I talk about the body and the nervous system and its capacity to feel, hold stress, not hold stress. Definitely watch at least that first video. I recommend all of them. Um, but that first video will really get into why we want to grow this capacity to be in our body and feel what's going on. Marielle asks, I'm feeling more flow starting to come as sexual trauma is released. Awesome. Is there anything else I can be doing? Thinking about working more specifically with the perineum and sexual organs. Yeah, that would be a great way to start. You know, find either someone that you can work with or work with them yourself um, through your own um, capacity to obviously masturbate. Uh, you can use sex toys to enter into those areas. But 
be very aware that you want to make sure that you're not overriding your system and doing too much too soon. Another way, um, you know, those balls that you can sit on, they're like those big bouncy balls that people use in exercise classes. Um, one way to work with the perineum that is a little less invasive, but still provides contact is you sit with a wider leg stance on that ball and you roll the pelvis over the pubic bone and over the perineum and you really feel that. But then this comes a bit more into some of the work that I teach, which is, are you able to keep an open connection to the throat? So while you are on that ball, you have to be able to work at sensing the other parts of the body. Does the jaw clamp down? Does the throat clamp down? Does the chest constrict? Do the eyes all of a sudden fixate in one area? Do the hands clench? And are you just holding on for dear life as you're on that ball? So again, it might be that you start with a chair, like I'm sitting on a stool, the kind of stool that a, a medical doctor might use in a, in, a, in a treatment room where they can roll back and forth and there's a soft cushion on it, but it's still firm. So something like that where you're gradually titrating into feeling the perineum, but it isn't just about working with those structures, everyone. It's have you got the capacity to track the rest of the body? Because we can do that work in the perineum, but if the rest of the levels of the body are clamping down in fear and gripping or dissociating, it's not going to do anything. So that goes back to, again, some of the basics um, that I teach in, the, in, in my general courses. But you can also get that working with a really good somatic practitioner but it's about keeping that central channel through the head all the way through to the perineum and down to the feet open and clear and breath going into all parts of the body. Okay. Let me just look at my notes, everyone. I want to make sure that I covered everything and I'll go back into the questions in a second. So yeah, I think we've covered a lot. Um, titration, again, that concept of going little bits at a time, slow, um, the capacity to bring the somatic senses back in and work with them is really the bread and butter of this work and really being able to color in and piece together these parts of our body that have gone numb that have gone kind of dead, right? And so we want to be able to bring these back to life, but in a way that doesn't overwhelm and override the system because we don't want to put the system into more survival stress. We don't want to put it into more shutdown. Um, okay, and then the healthy aggression work. Can't, oh, I cannot stress that enough. I've already posted some of the links to, I think, I mentioned to healthy aggression and working with anger. Um, we have an entire playlist actually here on this YouTube channel where we've collated all my um, special topic lectures and videos on healthy aggression, what healthy aggression is. Um, and then another uh, article that I'll get Diana to post is one that my husband wrote a while back on annihilation energy. So I call this kill energy. And again, I'm going to be very clear. This is not kill energy where you go out and you kill someone. This is where you feel the stored energy that never got to express to truly protect yourself, but in current time and you work with it in a safe way. So you're not harming yourself. You're not harming the stuff around you. You're not harming a person or your pets or your children. Because a lot of times violence that comes out against children and others is old trapped trauma that a person doesn't know how to work with. And so they get triggered and then boom, the violence starts, right? And so, but we, but, or, and I should say, we also have to recognize that our animal insti instincts want to get that out. It wants to get that energy out. If it doesn't, 
again, as I said at the top of the hour, our system will become depressed. We will trap those survival energies in, and this is what breeds chronic illness. This is what breeds fibromyalgia, autoimmune conditions, deep depression, et cetera. Okay. I saw a comment earlier, and I'm just going to address it, and then we will close up for the day. Um, know that everything I've said today has been lots of little pieces. And the reason why is because while there are steps, it really depends on where you're at. For some of you, you may be able to do a lot of this work on your own um, without needing a lot of guidance. And that's wonderful because you've done a lot of work already. For some of you, you might be brand new to this work and you still don't understand fully what fight, flight, and freeze is, and that's fine. That's where I suggest you get into that three-part healing trauma series that I have. And then for some of you, you might be somewhere in the middle and maybe you need to continue to do these practices, but you might, might be time to seek out a somatic practitioner to get some body work done from someone who understands the nervous system, who is nervous system informed, and you feel comfortable saying, I need you to stop, or can I have my eyes open, or can we do this massage with me sitting up? One of the things, um, two more things, usually not always when there is abuse, we are lying down. Not always, I know, but often that is the case. And so the moment a person lies down, it floods their system with physiological stress that puts them into that, that position, that memory, that's somatic, and often the system completely shuts down. And then we have the body work done, and we don't even know what occurred. We almost dissociate in that session. Um, I wrote a long-form article a long time ago, one of my first ever clients, um, I call her Grace. It's called the story of Grace. We'll pop that in. Um, I won't get into the whole story because we'll be here forever. But essentially, she came in with the symptoms of frozen shoulders. She couldn't move her shoulders. That was instigated by a broken rib. But the frozen shoulder was an old survival response of when she was being abused and molested sexually as a child, being tied down to things, to the bed, to trees in the backyard. And so the first thing we worked on when I was working with her was noticing and being aware that whenever she would lay down on my table, she would stop breathing. And so we worked for the first few weeks just having her sense her breath as she moved her body position down and it wasn't just okay lay down it's like do a little bit of a movement and then come back and then use your hands and come back and keep your eyes open and can you feel your feet can you feel your belly is your belly contracting and so as simple as that might seem you guys that is the level that we're wanting to work with so that we can truly get these survival responses out of our system now, the other thing that um, someone said is how do we how do we confront our perpetrators? And my my honest opinion on that is there is no reason to. And the reason why is there's many people here who their perpetrators are already gone. They've passed. They're dead. They're not on this current planet now. And so. I know that we can do this work, a person can do this work without ever seeing that person ever again, without ever talking to them ever again. It's about the, the physiology in your body, the physiology in your body and what it needs to release to feel whole again, to feel that life force energy again. Um, I do believe I did a video a little while ago. It was more on confronting just our abusers, um, maybe if they were our parents. And a lot of people get into trouble when they learn this work and they go and they confront their parents and say something like, you know, that you should have let me cry when I fell off my bike or I really needed you to be there when this happened. And the trouble with that is if that parent or if that perpetrator or whatever, if they haven't done their own work, and if they're still living in their survival responses, 
the chance of you being re-traumatized or traumatized, I should say again, due to that poor relational quality is very, very high. And so it's very important to work with yourself and find the good people in your life that you can work with who can serve as an interesting in a way proxy for the energy that you need to express so that you can be seen getting this out. But there's a lot of my clients and students who will do this work solo with titration, with touch, tracking, learning the science, learning the education, and they get that energy out and they don't ever see that person ever again. Um, so just wanted to put that in there because it's very, very important. Yes, this is complex, but we are really complex. I was just on a podcast yesterday talking to someone and um, I said something along the lines of there still is no machine in the universe. Well, on earth, I should say that matches the complexity of the human nervous system and our brain and our capacities and our intelligence and our creativity, um, which actually our creativity is at that root chakra. It's at the perineum. It's in our pelvis. That's where all of our life force energy is, right? But it is complex. The thing that's cool though, don't be, um, do not be disappointed. Do not be discouraged. I should say, I should say, because when we start to understand the science and we do the basic practices, the complexity becomes less scary. Right now, it's like I'm asking you, for those that are brand new, I'm saying, I need you to go live in this foreign country and all, and you don't know any of the language and you just have to figure it out. I did a video a little while ago on how learning this stuff as an adult if we never got it early on, is like learning a second language as an adult. We're having to relearn, and for some of us, learn for the first time how to be with our bodies, right? If we weren't touched even by our parents in a gentle way, if they handled us with force and their own stressors, the messaging we got from touch early on was that of fear. So that's another important thing. See, I'm, I'm going to just keep going here. If we were held by a parent that didn't know how to softly but firmly hold us, if they held us with jittery arms and didn't, you know, like, I don't know what to do with this thing, this baby, oh my God, stop crying. If, we're di if our diapers are changed with aggression and force and we're wiped, um, you know, with this, this disgust of you stink and this is terrible, that is essentially an insult to our humanity. That is an insult to our need for nurture. A mother bear is not going to lick her cubs violently. She will do it with care and attention and direction. And if that little cub needs to be fed, she isn't going to swat it away from her nipple. She's going to let it feed. Um, and so this is how far back a lot of these disconnections with our bodies are it goes that far back and even farther if we keep going but i won't because we're already at about an hour and a half today so um if you got here late be sure to go to the beginning if you're brand new here i encourage you to take some time to watch um, some of the other videos that we've posted alongside of this one that i've mentioned um, if you haven't done um, one of my drop-in classes, I have one coming up on Saturday. The theme will be connecting with the elements. So it's going to be a bit more earthly, a bit more bringing our body into the nature, the natural world. And we are part of the natural world. So that's why it's such a beautiful theme. Um, so that class is on Saturday at 12 PM. It's $19. It's a one-time thing. You get the recording. If you can't make it live, we've been doing these classes for two years, every month they're a hit. So definitely check that out. Um, and if you're not ready yet to dive into a class and you feel like this has been enough, then let it rest for a couple of days and then come back, watch a video, do one of my eBooks. I have some audio downloads on my site. We'll post the link there of all the free resources so you can download a free resource and I guide you through the basics of connecting to the physiology, to the environment and blending them together. Um, 
Yes. So hopefully this has been cohesive to the point where you get where I'm coming from. As you'll see, this isn't just one step, two step, three step, four step. It's it's holographic. There is there is a, a three dimensional aspect to this because we are three dimensional. We're complex. We're not just a flat board, and we need to do our healing in this light, in this um, intentionality. Um, thank you to everybody commenting. Thank you to my students who are still here hanging out, even after many years of being around and, and doing this work with me. Um, thank you, Diana, for posting in the links. Um, and I'll leave again saying this quote from Peter Levine one last time. I thank Peter for all that I've learned through him and with him around these topics. As he says, and I'll say it one more time, if we can't master our life force energy, and just remember, guys, that life force energy is what gets squashed and isn't available to us when we're living in fight, flight, and freeze. So when we can't master that life force energy, we can't master our life. We're living off of survival fumes. And right now, humanity is just immersed in survival fumes. And we got to turn the ship around 180 degrees. And a big part of doing that is us doing our individual work doing our individual work, letting the collective do its thing, do our work, heal, get into the body. And hopefully from there, we can really burst that life force energy that I know we all have. All right, everybody, I'm really going to hang up now. We'll talk to you later. Thank you for being here. Bye for now.